on this 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. My name is Seth Novak and I'm the pastor of Andy State Lutheran Church. On behalf of the entire community, welcome to worship this morning. Thank you for being here. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. Our worship bulletin with the order of service can be found in the link in the video description below. Uh, you can download that and follow along now if you haven't already. Before we begin our worship today, I would like to share some prayer concerns from our community. Uh, today we remember Rob and Joanna. Uh, Joanna had her hip replaced this week, and so we pray for her uh, recuperation and recovery from that. We also pray for Linda Zender's friend, Lisa, uh, who's a cancer survivor and has a biopsy scheduled this week. We pray for peace and for good results for that. I invite you to join me with the confession and forgiveness as it's printed in your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God of justice and love, you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, and awaken us to the needs of others. 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. For the time is drawing nigh. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. For the time is drawing nigh. Oh, children, don't get weary. Oh, children, don't get weary. Oh, children, don't get weary. Till your work is done. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Cause the time is drawing nigh. Oh, Sisters and brothers, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, brothers and sisters, keep on praying till the work is done. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed. The time is drawing nigh. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. For the time is drawing nigh. For the time is drawing nigh. For the time is drawing. Today's reading is from Amos chapter 5. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but took no oil with them. The wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout. Look, here comes the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Come, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. 
and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading from Amos today, my mind turns to thoughts of darkness. I wonder, have you ever experienced darkness so utter that it becomes almost tangible? I have. One summer when I was home from college, I went spelunking with my sister Cassie and my friends Matt and Charles. There's this cave in the Little Belt Mountains south of Great Falls. It's not marked on any map. There's no signs or directions to get you there. If you want to go there, you have to know where you're going. I'd been there once as a kid, but that was a long time ago, and I was the only one of the four of us who'd ever been. So even after getting directions from my dad on how to get there, we still had to stop and ask a local rancher once we got close. Once you get to this cave, there really isn't much to see. Just a hole in the ground with some rope. You climb about 30 feet down this narrow hole, mostly on a ladder with slippery uh, and missing rungs. In the last eight feet or so, you have to climb down hand over hand by rope. Once you're on the floor of that first room, you immediately have to get on your belly and slide through the mud under this little crevice that's only about 18 inches tall. From there, the cave goes back what seems like forever. It's probably only really only about a quarter of a mile or so. Um, but most of it is spent on your hands and your knees. One of the main features of this cave is the bottomless pit. Of course, it's not really bottomless, but when you're uh, on your hands and knees up against the side of the wall, looking over into this pit, it sure looks bottomless. Um, people throw rocks down there and you can't ever hear them hit the bottom. Once you crawl around this bottomless pit, you're most of the way to the end of the cave, to the big room. Now the big room is exactly what it sounds like. It's this cavern, uh, 500 feet across. This enormous open space that suddenly appears at the end of this tight, short scramble under the earth. And the ceiling of this cavern is maybe, I don't know, 100 feet up or something like that. And under that ceiling, the room is dominated by uh, this pile of fallen rock. It's a pile of boulders, really. So when we came to this big room, my sister and my friends and I decided for some reason that we should climb up to the top of this pile and sit there and eat our lunch. I don't remember exactly why we decided we wanted to climb to the top, Maybe it was for the view. Inside this cave, if you turn off your flashlight, the dark isn't just black. It's solid. It becomes a thing. You're as completely blind as if your head were in a sack. No light seeps in from the surface, and you can't see your own hand inches in front of your nose. Because this room is so large, most flashlights aren't powerful enough to see the opposite wall. So even with all of our lamps on, we were sitting here in an island of light amidst a sea of solid and impenetrable blackness. Now we made it to the top of the pile just fine, because all we had to do was keep going up. But because the darkness was so thick, and because the path through the boulders was so winding, Getting back down was a different story. Because, see, there's 360 degrees of down, but only one heading will get us back to where we came in. We started picking our way down the boulders, but we got turned around. Soon before we knew it, we weren't going down anymore, we were going up. We figured we must have found another pile, and so we thought, well, let's get to the top and see if we can see the summit we just came from. Well, so we kept going up, we got to the top, and what did we find? But our picnic area. The very same rock where we'd sat down to eat. We just made one giant circle. So, we started down again, 
This time, we were determined. We were just going to go in a straight line, as straight as we could. But once again, the uneven ground and the misleading dark brought us back again to our picnic area. Now, by this time, we were getting pretty frightened. We're here alone in this cave. We have no way of knowing for sure how to get out other than our memories and those that already failed us twice. We sat down and we collected ourselves and began to consider how we're going to find the bottom of this rock pile and how, once we did that, we were going to find the exit to this room. Most of us have never encountered dark like this. It's darn near impossible to find a place so dark and so silent as the inside the belly of the earth. Our world is filled with street lamps and light bulbs and LEDs uh, and computer screens. And even when it isn't, the moon and the stars provide even the faintest light and keep us from being completely enveloped in darkness. Even the deceptive shadows of the dark forest at night uh, give some point of reference. In that cave, there was nothing. We're so used to being able to see with even some clarity that those moments and those ways in which we can't see are completely disorienting and disturbing and even panic-inducing. Beloveds, we are living in times which are, please forgive the cliché, unprecedented. Never before has our generation been in this particular situation, this confluence of pandemic and contentious uh, election and climate change and public protest against injustice. Any one of these things by themselves would be enough to confound this, confound us. But all of them together? In a way, we are collectively sitting in that cave in Montana, huddled around our picnic spot for the third time or the 30th time or the 300th time, trying to figure out what to do next. In that moment, I had to fight down panic. Each of us wished dearly for some answer, some sign which way to go. If only, we said, if only we had thought to bring some candles or glow sticks and to leave one burning by the entrance to the room so that we could uh, pick out that, that tiny pinprick of light against the darkness. If only we had brought some string or twine so that we could uh, mark our way up and then find our way back. If only we had been prepared for this. But how could we have been prepared? How could we have known that this is what we were going to face, that that was where we were going to end up? How could we have known, beloveds? How could we have known that in November of 2020, we'd be worshiping from our homes and avoiding our friends and afraid to go outside? How could we have known that days after the presidential election, we'd still be waiting to find out who'd won? How could we have known that it would become imperative for us to state the obvious, that black lives do in fact matter? Is it any wonder that we're starting to panic now, children of God? Is it that it's that panic that's creeping into our lives, in our, into our relationships, into our civic engagements, and it's starting to turn us against one another. Just like Matt and Cassie and I bickered about who was right and which way we had to go down. Is it any wonder that lost in such a present and threatening darkness, we begin to fight among ourselves just like that? But the hard truth, my beloveds, is that fighting amongst ourselves is not going to get us out of here. It's tempting to point out the faults and the failures of others, but Amos reminds us today that we all share some responsibility for ending up where we are. Whether it's fair or not, whether we deserve it or not, we're stuck here, in the dark, and nothing's going to change that. The darkness of that cave was a judgment on Matt and Charles and Cassie and me. Not a punishment, not a condemnation, but a judgment, a moment which revealed a certain truth, that we had not been prepared. 
We had successfully fumbled our way into the cave, but blind groping wasn't going to get us back out of it. What Amos and Jesus both want us to hear, I think, is that the day of the Lord is coming. That whether we are ready for it or not, there will come a moment when we are faced with that uh, same sort of clarity that the four of us had in that cave. Justice is coming. Healing is coming. That moment of clarity, it is coming. And that's good news, but it's also a wake-up call. We need to be ready because like exploring that cave, we want to see those things, but we may not fully realize what they mean. With all that is uncertain, there is one thing that we do know. We know that God is God and that we are God's people, God's children. We know that God's love will not leave us stranded in this big room, huddled atop this pile of boulders. We know that God has a vision for the wholeness and the creation, the whole, excuse me, the wholeness of creation and the healing of humanity. That although that vision might be delayed, it cannot be held back. The bridegroom is coming, even if we don't know when. This thick darkness is no obstacle to God, for in the beginning, everything was darkness, and the Spirit of God moved over the darkness, and God spoke light into being. That's what I mean when I say that we know that God is God. We know that God is going to keep doing what God has always done, bringing life, creating light, doing justice, loving creation into being. Now the four of us made it out of that room, and we made it out by working together, by trusting one another, by coming up with a plan and sticking to it. We hadn't prepared coming in, but now sitting atop that mound, we had to prepare how we were gonna get out. We decided that if our problem was not being able to go in a straight line, we'd leapfrog down the pile. So we, uh, we still remembered which direction we'd come in from, so we sat facing that, and we started down. We left one person at the top, and we went down in a straight line, and they guided us. And once we got to another point, we left another person, and the other two kept going. So that we, and we kept doing that so that we could make a point, a line in between each of us to make sure we were still headed in the right direction. And lo and behold, when we finally reached the bottom, there was the tunnel entrance waiting for us. We made it out that day, children of God, but you can bet that next time I go down in that cave, and I do intend to go back, you can be darn sure that I am bringing some glow sticks with me. Now that I know what I need to be prepared, I'm going to be ready next time. I'm not going to count on chance. As we wait with hopeful expectation for the day of the Lord, I wonder what we will need to be ready. I wonder what this moment is teaching us about what we wish we had, about what we feel we need more of, and how that is going to help us prepare. I wonder what kind of oil we are being called to put in our flasks. I may not have solid answers for you, but I know one who does. One who's been to this cave before and who knows what we need when we get there. What was the oil that sustained Jesus through his life, through his trials? What was it allowed, that allowed him to stand up and shake off the crucifixion? What was it that guided him in his every moment of time among us? I suspect that's the oil we're looking for. As we plan ahead for that great and terrible day of the Lord, it's good to know that we're not planning alone.
This month we are embarking together on a project to build a culture of generosity in our congregation. We know from experience that the people of Agnus Dei are already exceedingly generous, and we hope to solidify that foundation of generosity and build on it for the benefit not just of this congregation, but of our whole community. In the midst of these uncertain times, your generosity is more important than ever. Even though we've had to stop doing much of what we were doing before the pandemic or change how we've been doing it, there is still so much work for the church to do in these days. Some of us, like me, are blessed to be able to have a steady income and a job to do every day, even though it's a lot different than it was at this time last year. Some of us are living on a fixed income, and while we've not been affected by the pandemic, we may not have a lot of uh, flexibility in how we have, are able to spend our money. Still others are facing furloughs, reduced hours, or unemployment. I know that all of us are aware of the financial needs of Agnes Day and COVID Tide, as well as so many other organizations, all doing good work uh, in the world and in our communities, and so many neighbors uh, who need help. I know that if we could, we would all donate 10 or 100 times as much as we are now. To each of us, wherever we are and whatever financial state we're in, I'd like to remind you of St. Paul's advice to the church in Corinth. The Corinthians had pledged money to support the church in Macedonia, a project that Paul was working on. And when he wrote his second letter to the Corinthians, he reminded them of this commitment. He said, each of you must give as you've made up your minds, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. He didn't try to threaten or force or cajole them to giving more. He simply reminded them of the commitment that they had made. And he reminded them that the God who gives all gifts is capable of giving even more. He wanted them to know that because of that, it's not the size of the gift that matters, but the attitude with which it's given. The one who supplies the seed to the sower and the bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness, he writes. This is still true now. Even in the middle of pandemic, God is still providing us with gifts to share. Those might be different gifts than we had at this time last year, but they come from the same God, and they are intended not only to sustain each of us individually, but to bless us so that we might be a blessing to the world around us. As we prepare to receive the greatest of God's gifts in Holy Communion this morning, Phyllis and Marilyn would like to thank you for the ways that the gifts this congregation has shared with the global work of Dining for Women have impacted the lives of thousands of women globally. God is continuing to supply seed to the sowers so the harvest of good works might be multiplied. Hi, I'm Phyllis Brandt. And I'm Marilyn Collier. And we are the co-chairs of Gig Harbor Chapter of Dining for Women. And the first thing we want to say is to thank you for opening your doors, Agnes Day members, to the community for this worthwhile effort to address the needs of people that we will never see. It is a witness to our community and to women who come to our meetings who are not members that this community of faith really does take seriously the call to help those in need. Dining for Women addresses the needs for women and children in extreme poverty. And by that we mean living under $2 a day. The uh, projects that we support and learn about in Dining for Women address gender equity for women and girls through education, health care, and economic sustainability. Over our 10 years of being a chapter in Gig Harbor, and we only meet eight times a year, but we have uh, drawn together funding up to seven, over actually $70,000, which shows the generosity of our members, as well as the witness to our community that this is what we're about at August Day. So we would like to thank you for letting us use the parish hall and the kitchen 
for a setting for our, me our meetings, as well as being that kind of witness to our community. The Gig Harbor chapter of Dining for Women actually started at the lakes before this parish hall in this church was built. There were very few of us that first meeting, all of them church members who met together and uh, decided that we want to commit ourselves to this organization which assists women and girls throughout the world. After this parish hall was, was completed, about a year or so later, we started meeting here at Anya's Day. Um, we have grown in membership, so now that probably 25% of the women that we see each month are from our church. The rest are from the greater Gig Harbor community, and we're very, very proud of that growth. And the fact that this chapter of, of Dining for Women, though the organization is sectarian, it's not church-related at all, it is still fulfilling the gospel injunction of assisting your neighbor and, and those people who are marginalized, those people who are poor, who don't have opportunities. Uh, this chapter, like all the Dining women, dining for Women cha uh, chapters around the country, give a hand up, not a hand out. And we're proud of the work that we have done in this organization and thankful and grateful to this congregation for making this space available where this idea got its roots. Thank you very much. Let us pray. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In time to bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke, his, broke bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let the church say amen. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Amen. Spirit, come, Spirit of Freedom, and let the Church say Amen. Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of that resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. If you're not receiving the meal with us this morning, receive this blessing. May the God of promise bring you light in the darkness. Amen. If you are receiving the meal with us today, hear this word of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Receive the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is eternal. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal, you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey. Strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children. And give us glad and generous hearts as we meet you on the way. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Before we conclude today, I'd like to share just a few announcements. Um, the first is that, believe it or not, Advent is almost upon us. With the pandemic, uh, we know that the holidays this year are going to look a lot different. Many of us are not going to be able to celebrate as we would like by visiting family or coming together for candlelight Christmas Eve service. In order to help us remember that we are alone in this together, during our Advent worship services, we'll be inviting each of you to light an Advent wreath in your own homes. Some of you may already have Advent wreaths or logs among your Christmas decorations, uh, but if you don't, or if you'd like to make a craft, on each day we'll be supplying candles and instructions for making your own wreath uh, that you can use this, this December. Each week, we'd love uh, to share photos and videos of you lighting those wreaths in your own homes. Uh, so I'll be uh, asking for more, uh, asking you to, about that more later. Um, the packets with the candles and the instructions will be available for pickup from the church beginning on November 22nd. Um, if you're not able or not comfortable to pick up a packet, uh, please call the church office and we will arrange to have one delivered to you. These packets also will contain instructions for making a Jesse tree. Uh, if you've never heard of that, a Jesse tree is a, uh, a tree or a twig or something that's got uh, on which you hang uh, ornaments for different Bible stories and there's an ornament for each day in Advent. Um, this is a great activity to do with your family or by yourself um, to kind of uh, give you a devotional practice for Advent uh, to spend some time with these stories. Uh, the packet will include paper ornaments that you can cut out and decorate yourself. Uh, and then you can hang them on a, a twig or a paper tree, or you can hang them on your Christmas tree um, to remind you of all the, the, the different stories of God's salvation and the coming Messiah. We'll also be offering nightly devotions via Zoom every weekday during Advent. These will be very, very short things, only about five to ten minutes each, um, but there'll be enough time for us to come together and see friends and be strengthened in our Advent journey together. These devotions will occur at 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, and we will have information about a Zoom link and all of that posted as we get closer. Devotions will come from Father Richard Rohr's book, Preparing for Christmas. Um, that's available on Amazon and thrift books and through local bookstores and we'd like to encourage you to uh, get a copy of that yourselves if you'd like so you can follow along but you don't need to. The church will also have a, a very small number of copies available if you can't find one. Finally, I also wanted to let you all know that I will be out of the office beginning or I will be out of the office next week, um, uh, Monday through Sunday, uh, which unfortunately means I will be missing our conference congregational meeting which is happening next Sunday. Um, I apologize about that. I wish the timing had worked out differently, but um, that's kind of the way it goes sometimes. So uh, that also means we will have uh, a guest preacher with us next Sunday. So um, I hope that you will join us for worship again. 
Once again, thank you for being part of this worship service today. Um, I know this isn't quite the same as gathering, but it is so good to be here with you all in any capacity. Um, if you found the service meaningful, I invite you to please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Uh, you can gather with Anu Stay or right here on this channel for worship every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. and every Wednesday at 7 p.m. as we pray Vespers together using Holy Evening Prayer. As I said, although our building is closed, the church is still open. On our website, anustaylutheran.org, you can get involved in one of the many things going on in this congregation, uh, including Zoom links to our Wednesday Bible study, uh, the prayer shawl knitting group, or the faith formation offerings we have, as well as uh, information on ways that you can get involved in serving a local community. That can be found under the Ministries tab at the top. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another, with someone you know, using a phone call or a text or an email, or by sending them the link to this video so that you can worship together. God bless you in your week.